Thank you very much for, uh, for organising uh, the session. We are from uh, the University of Manchester and uh, last year we started a project called uh, Prehistory to Primary Schools. Um, and we did this because recently uh, prehistory has been added to uh, the Key Stage 2 curriculum. Um, but it's really a subject that not many Key Stage 2 teachers feel very comfortable in, in teaching. They don't always have a lot of understanding, a lot of knowledge of, of prehistory. Um, there also aren't that many resources out there for them, um, so they don't feel massively supported. Also, elements of the curriculum themselves are not terribly helpful. So if you go and look at the curriculum for Key Stage 2, it says something along the lines of, you should be teaching your children how things change in prehistory, such as, why don't you have a look at the hunter-gatherers that live at Scara Bray? Now, the early Neolithic uh, hunter-gatherers. Yeah, the early Neolithic, which, which is, they're not hunter-gatherers. Scarabray is an early Neolithic. So even in the curriculum, there are these really problematic um, uh, mistakes, um, which suggest that how a teacher is meant to be able to deal with this if, if the curriculum perhaps doesn't deal with it that well to begin with. So we wanted to produce some teaching resources that actually got across our academic understanding of, of prehistory and deliver it to uh, teachers in primary schools. So they have you know, the same narratives and the same understanding that we do. Um, so the project began by developing uh, resource packs for primary school teachers with the aim that we could give the teachers the knowledge and the understanding to teach prehistory themselves instead of us going into a school and delivering a one-hour session. How many schools are in Greater Manchester? 500, 600? It's, it's beyond our capabilities. So what we did was we produced resource packs um, which have uh, written uh, guides, short written guides, which breaks each of the four key um, prehistoric periods, the Mesolithic, the Neolithic, the Bronze Age and the Iron Age, breaks it down into to nice simple themes, where people lived, how people lived, what people used in terms of technology, and what people believed. Um, we gave them a set of artefacts. Some of them are experimentally uh, reproduced, and we can show you some of those in the workshop after tea. Um, and we also provide them with 3D printed artefacts as well. And there are some over on that table that you're more than welcome to go and have a look at, including this Neolithic leaf-shaped arrowhead. Um, and these are about 60p to print and give to schools. And the kids can't destroy them. Well, I mean, if they can, I bet they can actually. But if they do, we can replace them. It's really simple stuff. And then the other thing that we, uh, we wanted to do was we wanted to include a sort of graphic novelette, so a four-page um, comic inside each one of these booklets that could get across the key themes that we had in our written guides, but would also include the artefacts that they can get their hands on and some of the big ideas that we mention. So it's sort of like a way to really bind all of these different things together. We also realised that comics were an amazing way to get across a tonne of detail the characterisation that I want to give across, I'm, I deal with animal remains, so I want to think about what the animals looked like and what they were. Environmental archaeologists want to tell you about the trees and the plants. Other material specialists want to tell you about the, the pottery or the lithics. We realised that we could get all of this across in our comics. Um, so that was really where we started, um, and it was then up to Tony to turn our archaeological hopes into reality. Hi. Yeah, so um, this was my brief as I interpreted it. I'm pretty sure it wasn't this badly expressed to me in the meeting. Uh, but these were, so I, when, I, when I came to it, my background briefly is I'd come across John at a, um, a science and history workshop type thing. Um, and I'm producing my comic about diabetes, which is not on the face of it very similar, but what I was looking at was uh, how we could, or what they wanted me to look at was how we could weave a narrative around the research, uh, a and a visual narrative that goes with it. Um, sequential narratives, if you, if you know about comics, if you like comics, then sequen sequential art is, is, is another way of thinking about them. And it's, it's really useful in terms of thinking about how we, we want to talk about the periods that we, we've got here. Um, so this is my rationale. I hate reading from the screen, so I'm going to read from the screen. 
Uh, with this in mind, the narratives are, are deliberately from multiple perspectives, drawing upon, drawing upon the idea of objects uh, as symbolic and meaningful part of prehistory. Uh, sorry, uh, part of prehistory social structure, framing what we might now consider spiritual existence outside of modern subjectivity, and considering what this might mean for a narrative that goes beyond individual perspective. You're probably thinking this is way beyond the kids, right? But this isn't. This is this is this part of it for me was that my brief was I had to engage the teachers as well as the kids. They have to be enthused, otherwise they're not going to be enthusiastic. So, um, for me, the process involved a fair, fair few processes. Uh, the main part of that was me to, me to actually understand the research that was going on. Uh, conversations with uh, Nick, with John, with Hannah, all these sorts of things were very much part of what was, what's going on next. Discussion of that information. Then I get into the bit that I'm more familiar with, which is coming up with a storyboard and a scenario. Now, they, they, John particularly came up with some storyboards, uh, some loose storyboards, which I'll talk through in a, in a minute. And then I started getting busy on the narrative. So we'll start getting some actual pictures now. Okay, so just in terms of what I'm talking about, in terms of the research, the, the stuff that's not highlighted, this was the, the, the text was uh, sent over to me. I then started annotating it, highlighting it. Drawing, drawing vague ideas that were coming to my mind. Not all of these made it into the comics, but there's a lot of a lot of this process is drawing is thinking. And this is why I think comics are so brilliant in terms of communicating because they are literally showing you thought. Okay, you don't just see the image as if you see the whole thought process that goes into it. You have to. Um, from there, this is sorry about the dropped S. Um, these are some of John's storyboards on the uh, far side there. And then me, literally, as, as we're talking about it in the meetings, these are me doodling, uh, coming up with how, where are these going to go, thinking about composition for the pages, thinking about the way in which uh, the, the, the story can start to fit together. Now, one of the key things uh, in, that came out of these conversations uh, was the idea that we were going to tell these comics from the perspective of the objects, which I think is going to go into in a, a little bit more detail. But visually, that, that provides... an. Uh, an interesting starting point. How do you frame that? How do you start thinking about where that works? These are my original thumbnails. Now, I can tell you now that not all of it made it in, which is quite useful. If you're thinking about doing comics, the communication process between the, 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 the research and the artists is really useful. So, for example, uh, the far at the bottom down here, you've got, if you compare that to the, the bottom page over there, or what I'll show you later on, you'll see that the Durham walls goes and doesn't have stone Stonehenge's replaces it, and there's now a burning body instead because that's much more fun. Um, uh, so there's, there's 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 lots of things that change at this point, but it's really useful in terms of the text. This is me taking the the research and the initial sort of scenarios that have been given to me and thinking about how am I going to express this. Remember, this is coming from the object point of view, so it has to be a little bit enigmatic. Uh, and I want to do that. And, and that actually is something I, uh, I want to come on to as we go through uh, and thinking about the design. of And the, the, one of the brilliant side, things I think about comics, and tell me if I need to shut up and move on, because I have got to press go on my phone. Um, <laughs> in terms of when, you, when you're coming up with comics, I say drawing is thinking. For me, another really useful thing about comics is the fact that although they can be great at communicating simply, they are also brilliant at communicating complex ideas at the same time. Uh, and as a result, you go from thinking about how you're going to frame this story, how are you going to, you know, things like going through the stages of corpse up there, to how do you move quickly across the whole of the UK, uh, all these sorts of things. And then when you start to add colour into it, you add in another layer. This is a, you know, it's a multimodal form of communication. And everything you're doing is communicating something slightly different. Uh, in my case, my, my particular use of colour, I think, uh, particularly in this project, makes things strange. So that you have a naturalistic approach, but then I've decided, like, for example, behind these wonderful narrative, uh, naturalistic bits, I've, I've put a load of red in there because I don't want you to be too comfortable with that. I'm not very good at that. Or I've decided that this has to be particularly dramatic, so I'm using massive amounts of contrast at the bottom there. Again, how are you going to use the text? Even the fact that you can put the, the text in colours, the actual uh, medium of comics is, there's, there's loads of things here. And that's not even considering the things I haven't chosen to do. You know, there's no big 
um, words zooming across the page on this or anything like that, or there's, there's, no, there's no real action sequences in that sort of sense. This is very much a sort of stand back, but you can do all these different things. Uh, that's kind of a very, very brief whistle-stop tour of, of what I did. Um, if you've got any questions about it, ask me later, and I hope that was five minutes, because otherwise you two would... Um, yeah, anyway, <laughs> moving on next. So, on the whole, it came out pretty well. Um, we gave it to some schools. The schools really liked them. Uh, the, the kids, we managed to do a, a short promotional video for the project, and we've got some great footage of loads of these children sort of engaging with the comics. They really, really enjoyed them. And overall, some of the teachers um, sort of concluded that they were useful because of the general lightness of the packs. Some other teaching resources are exceptionally heavy, like hundreds of pages in some cases of written materials, which teachers can't work their way through. So, so the comics were an amazing way to get that light touch, but actually communicate lots of detail. But there were also things that may be uh, challenges for us along the way of doing this project. Yeah, so, um, so the first, we, we, we went chronologically, but also we all do the Mesolithic. So that's yeah. partly why we started with the Mesolithic. Um, and so the, 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 first, um, uh, com uh, the first booklet that we produced and the first uh, uh, comic that we got Tony to do was for, for, for the Mesolithic. Uh, and um, John and Nick had put the booklet together, sent it over to me to, to have a look, and I opened it up. I went, oh, ha hang on a second, because um, the front cover of the Mesolithic had this picture, not with the other bits on it, just the picture of the man with the woman with her back to the picture. And uh, I'd probably just come straight out of a lecture where I'd been talking about oh, where I'd been talking about problems with the way that gender stereotypes are, are represented within within particularly within hunter gatherer um, uh, work. So this is based on Moses' work from 1993 and uh, and her, her PhD. She looked at gender stereotyping in pictorial reconstructions of human origins, and she looked at all the different pictures she could find and pointed out that there was a, a real trend to show uh, men in the centre of the picture being sort of active and dominant, and women all stooped uh, and uh, subservient. Uh, and so when I um, opened up uh, that document and saw it, my heart leapt into my mouth and I had to say, um, um, I think there might be a bit of a problem with this, chaps. Um, and part of Moses' thing is that the, the images themselves, images constitute arguments in themselves and we're sending this out to schools and it's, it's really important. Actually, amazing, subsequently, we, we looked at other resources that exist. So for primary schools, there's a, there's a resource called Twinkle. Um, it is called, yeah, it is called Twinkle, isn't it? That feels vastly inappropriate. It's called Twinkle. And um, <laughs> And um, it, it, the, their resources about prehistory, if you've ever come across them, they also use like comic style representations. But the one that absolutely blew my mind was a picture of uh, a man and a woman from the Neolithic, I think. Uh, and they were basically, the man was basically dressed like that. And then the woman was wearing this kind of like slinky, sexy fur dress that was sort of like this, sort of maybe over one shoulder and very tight and short. Uh, and, and I think that um, that's something that so therefore was sort of quite on our, our minds that we don't want to replicate these kind of binary androcentric ways of, 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 of representing the past. Um, so we talked this through effectively this kind of unconscious bias because the the the, the trouble it the, not the trouble but the, the thing is is that the rest of the pictures for the Mesolithic are so diverse um as as Tony's talked about he's uh, he, he we we discussed the way that we should uh, foreground objects within these and in fact <clears throat> the narratives uh, that we that are told through these through these comics are told from really non-human uh but well non uh, live human perspectives. Um, so, in fact, the um, uh, the Mesolithic oh, come the the Mesolithic one is told from the perspective of so effectively from somebody who's died and follows sort of their remains through through uh, through the the annual life course. The the Neolithic one comes from a cow's perspective uh, and cattle effectively, and all of the images so beautifully foreground 
artifacts as central within everything. Um, and, and yet this one picture, and, and actually quite a lot of the pictures aren't so gendered, they can be, you can look at them in, in quite sort of non-binary ways. Um, and, uh, and, and yet this one, the, the one classic one where this sort of unconscious, this, this uh, stereotype exists was the one that we'd slapped on the cover. So we talked that through and it was really useful, I think, to address that element of un unconscious bias because it allowed us to, to think about how actually how, how we want to, how we wanted to represent these these periods in the front when we're speaking out to the schools. And we realise that we've got this wonderful diversity of different stories within the, the just these four pages. And so it's sort of influenced then the way that we um, uh, have done the cover, put the covers together to be much more about a montage and therefore to, to much more accurately, I think, represent the multiplicity of lifeways in the, the, the various periods that we're looking at. And I think that's another sort of challenge in the process. And, and Tony talked about it, and I just wanted to sort of expand a little bit more because one of the, the things that we're all interested in, so yesterday I wasn't in the relational hunter-gatherer session because I was speaking elsewhere. I was speaking in the feminist session. But these guys were, uh, Nick ran the relational hunter-gatherer session yesterday. And we're all very interested in that kind of approach. I'm particularly interested in assemblage theory, particularly interested in thinking about materials as vibrant and pulsing and effective within prehistoric life and um, so the way that, that that Tony has drawn these really captures that uh, and and so you can see from, from these just a few bits and bobs with the, the antlers uh, and the deer and the animals this sort of foregrounds Nick's particularly these, are that, these two are from the Mesolithic one foregrounds Nick's sort of interest in, in the role of animals but I really like this one from the Neolithic as well. It's a bit small, um, but uh, it's the cattle. It's telling it from the cattle's perspective, but also you've got all the vessels on the cattle. You've got all the different sort of bits of material culture and these mixtures of daily life are so sort of explicitly foregrounded in the, the picture. And that's the real value of being able to use comics because no child, probably not anyone in this room, wants to have a big deep chat about Deleuze and Guattari, but everybody can see that and pick up on these uh, the, these sort of effectively sort of uh, theoretical themes through um, through the, uh, the the comics, which is fantastic. Um, but this also leads us into sort of another challenge because, as I mentioned before, the, the, the uh, one about the Mesolithic comes from the perspective of a dead person. And for that, I'm going to hand over to John. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, um, there's a little bit of reiteration, but I think it's just to highlight. Um, we did it in a bit of an ad hoc way. It was who did we know who was teaching at school that we could get to use our stuff. Um, the school that I had a connection with was Brookburn Primary School. And, oh. and I was able to go in, take some stuff in, do a little session with the teachers and the kids and get some feedback on our um, teaching materials. So... For what I'm going to talk about is just how we approached it, the resources we produced, and the feedback that I got from, that we got, but in particular the feedback I got. Um, I'm going to then talk about where it's going, because, it, you know, it's in progress. We're all sort of learning as we go, and we're trying to find out what will work. Um, so I've talked to somebody from a forest school that I think might help feed into what we're doing and then just talk a little bit about how we might adapt it. So, as Nick and Tony mentioned, at university we teach adults. Um, we don't teach kids, but teachers teach kids. So our approach was, let's try and produce stuff for the teachers. Um, and we wanted to make it easy for them because they've got loads to do. They haven't got loads of resources, they haven't got loads of money, and they're really busy. So we wanted to select some artefacts we could print cheaply, provide them with. Um, we also included local sites, so if they got into the idea, they could develop it themselves. They could go 
and visit the sites, which is, you know, is probably what we all do anyway, of, you know, when we've got some free time. And also graphic novel format for all the reasons we talked about. You know, it can be a pleasure to read it. It doesn't have to be that extra text that you have to do at the end of the day. So that was like our rationale and how it fed into what we produced. And again, as has been said, we wanted to tie it into real um, case studies. So we wanted to provide them with not just what we know, but why, how have we got there? So we wanted to link it to actual archaeological case studies that we perhaps use and um, use those things to provide narrative ideas. Like one of the ideas was that a bone is the narrator of the Neolithic one, or is it Mesolithic. the Mesolithic one? So, when we, when I did the session, um, s feedback was generally really good. Um, and one of the outcomes that we hadn't anticipated was that the teachers thought that the kids could actually use the comics themselves. It wasn't necessarily, even though we aimed it at adults and we thought it was aimed at that kind of age group, the teachers saw the possibility of the kids really getting into it. But with the caveat, uh, however, some of it is a bit dark. So there's parts of it that I don't think the kids will like that much. So that's what we, we, we produced the stuff, we took it into schools, we tried it out, and we got some feedback. So the question is, how are we going to use that feedback? Because that's the stage we're at at the moment. So I've been talking to a number of people. Um, one of them is a woman who runs a forest school. And she, um, I might have to refer to this for this bit because um, I typed it this morning. <laughs> um, she had to produce a session for primary school kids. Again, um, a bit like Paul said, with, with some issues. So these were kids that obviously had problems. Within the group, one had recently experienced the death of a parent and another one, the parent had a terminal diagnosis. So it sort of reveals as well why teachers may be very hesitant about leaping in with quite dark stuff. You know, there's a lot of factors perhaps that they're anticipating having to deal with. So Sarah, my friend Sarah, who runs the school, she based it on two books that are aimed at I think four to eight year olds. And she, um, she focused on a narrative from the books and also activities. And I think that's a key thing that I want to emphasize, activities, exploring death and rebirth. And she used other cultural contexts to start talking about that. Um, and without going into too much detail, because I can't, I don't know too much detail about it, but she received positive feedback from both the kids and the teachers. So what we can draw from that for our project is that it is possible for both kids and teachers to deal with stuff that is a bit dark. And that's our thing, that we want to be providing our understanding. We don't want to be watering it down. We want it to be what we understand and what we think was going on and so I think what the stage we're at now is considering what else do we need to do to facilitate the teachers to provide this kind of support so they can feel comfortable about dealing with stuff that might be a bit dark but that can obviously be really valuable both for the kids and for the teachers themselves opening it up obviously open things up for them so they can think more differently about things. So, as well as, or along with that, there's a session going on in a different room now. Um, it's, it's called the Death Cafe. And um, it's, it's by someone who used to be at Manchester, um, Karina Croucher. So I'll, I'll just read out what it says. So her project, or the project that she's part of, Dying to Talk, uses archaeological case studies as the catalyst for these death conversations in order to showcase the diversity in death practices globally 
and challenge assumptions regarding our own attitudes to death, dying and bereavement. So I think that I'm going to talk to Karina, we're going, we're going to talk about it and think about she's dealing with older, younger pe young people, older than our primary school kids, but what strategies have they come up with in order to structure sensitive with these conversations? So I think that's, I think that's it for this bit. Thank you very much.